Okay. My wonderful students. A week from today, we have our final exam. Right? It's at 10 a.m. Make sure that you're here on time. If you don't get here before the first person finishes, you cannot take the final. If you cannot take the final, that means your grade is toast. If you have an A now, you might only have a C if you don't take the final. If you see, I have a C now, you're not going to pass. So uh, just make, be aware of that. Office hours tomorrow at 11 to 1. Talk about grades if you want. It's normal this time of semester. Uh, a couple things I want to review with you before we get down to the quantum theory of hydrogen. Our main topic for today. Uh, SI this afternoon as usual. This will be the last day for regular SI. So uh, be there or be square. There's a big SI review next Monday to get you ready for the Tuesday final. Wait a minute. Our final is Tuesday? Yeah. All right. So uh, apparently, Sark has a page for all the different classes where they have an SI review. You know, chemistry, biochemistry, and so forth. So here's the and here's a blow up of you know what you guys. So that would be in the Pegasus Ballroom Monday, two to four thirty p.m. And as I always say, I'll repeat now for you and for all within the sound of my voice that if you can only make it to 30 minutes at the beginning or the last 45 minutes or anything, you know, 20 minutes at 3 o'clock and then you have to bust out of there, uh, you do it. Do, as much as you could do at SI, It'll definitely help you. And that's in addition to what you do today. In general, uh, the um, student union puts together a fairly nifty little program called Study Union. Here's the website. You can look it up. For those of you that are newbies, newbie freshmen, don't raise your hand. I know who you are. Uh, but... Uh, they have a lot of different review sessions and activities and stuff to help you study for finals. My advice to you newbie freshmen especially is to make sleep your number one weapon. In other words, do not come into my final without having had a night's sleep. Decent five, six hours. If you don't, if you pull an all-nighter before my midterm exam, you can kiss your brain goodbye because you're going to be working. I mean, it's, I'll tell you what, it's going to be difficult. And even if I put really easy questions on there from number one through number 100, it would still be difficult because you have to remember stuff all the way back in August. And even easy stuff from August is going to be challenging to you on December 4th. December, what, what's the date? December 4th. All right, so... So make sure... and. This business of, oh, well, the dog ate my alarm clock or whatever, you know, that sounds nice. It's funny. But if it's you and you don't get here in time to take the final before the first person leaves, you're toast. And, you know, it's tough toenails for you. And I've had students do that and they, they just flunk. So do not let that happen to you. You want to have a good night's sleep, you know, five, six hours if possible. No all-nighters. 
And, and I'm declaring myself your honorary mother-in-law on this for the next week. So I can nag you without limit. <laughs> so just, you know, make sure plenty of sleep. And, you'll, and that's for all your classes. Now you guys that are seniors, you already, you already know how to do this stuff. It's newbie freshmen. All right, let's talk about grades. A bunch of stuff to talk about, Nicole, about grades. And is she wearing those sparkly slippers again? Those unicorn? No, she's not. Okay. No, we're good. Uh, grade updates. A um, couple things I want to go over with you. There's a bunch of new stuff in uh, your grades page. And there's a bunch of stuff I forgot to upload this morning, but I'm going to try to upload today, this after class. i got a ton of stuff to do. But what we got up there, uh, first of all, best two out of three midterms. Now, I did this really carefully last night. And I went through and I segregated all the students that only took two exams. And then I kind of separated them by, well, they missed exam one, or they missed exam two, or they missed exam three. And there's a few. There's not many. There's about 20, 30. And we got about 400 students in the two sections. So most of you guys have been here for all three, which is really good. It's usually like that. For a few of you that have missed an exam, so I, I, I put down... You know, out of 100, your best two. If you missed an exam, it's your only two. If you're here for three exams, it's your best two. And add them together. But if you missed an exam, you know, I put down a code so that you would know which are the two exams that I'm counting for you. So if you have code 12, 1, 2 signifies you missed exam 3, which a few of you did. So it'll say code 12 on there, exam code 12. A uh, few of you missed exam 2, that'll say code 13. And a bunch of you missed exam 1, that'll be code 2, 3. Because you were here for exam 2 and exam 3. So that's all right. And if you were here for all three of them, it'll say 1, 2, 3. Meaning you were here for all three. All right. Another thing, homework. Right now we've got 308 points on the books except for homework uh, or mini review seven chapter seven mini review which for some reason i cannot get to download from great river yet but i'm going to try to get that done asap all right also some of you pointed out doctor from the you know the morning section i think it was mainly uh some of the, you know, like uh, mini review six had the two problems that were blooped up. And so I had to give everybody four points for those two questions. So that's not in web courses. It is in my spreadsheet, right? I didn't upload that one last night, but I did upload your, your totals and stuff for homework and best two out of three. Also, I uploaded participation. All right, so right now, coming into class today, 66 questions on the books. And so that means the 85% leeway factor is 57 answers or more. And that comes out of the, the decimal part of your roundup number, as you know. Uh, and that converts to 25 points as of 11.15. 11.15, uh, November 15th, uh, is the um, last time we did clicking, regular clicking. I mean, we did clicking on exam three, but uh, that's already in the exam. By the way, uh, one person ate, totally crushed exam three. Every single point. I can't remember who it was. Uh, and also I want to mention, I forgot to upload your exam three clicking and your exam three total. But I have it on my web courses. And so when you look at the total points as of 1120, the exam three total is in there. 
in the form of, you know, best two out of three, if that's your best, if that's one of your best two. Okay, so, um, and, but I, I will be uploading those exam, the exam three clicking, the exam three total, so you can, you know, just verify that stuff. All right, and here's what it looks like inside web courses. So you have a, a bunch of points, you know, like maybe 133 out of 150. Um, everybody's on the 150 point basis now. Um, and then if you, and this is if you um, display your grades page, uh, I think it goes not according to due date, but according to assignment type. I think you can, that's one of the options. And then you'll see these numbers at the very top. Uh, homework points as of 1120, and then participation points as of 1115. Now, in this example here, this is for an imaginary student, uh, 24 out of 25 homework points, 23 out of 25 participation points. You know, that participation is based on how many you've answered, as you know. Uh, there's a whole lot. That's together. That's 47 out of 50. And that's like getting a 47 out of 50 on a midterm. And for many of you, you're at least that high. There's a lot of 48s. There's a, four, a lot of 49s. And there's a whole bunch of 50 out of 50 from participation and homework. And that, my wonderful students, is why my patented grading system is so nice. But you don't realize it until the very end of the semester, which is where we are now. But I knew in August that at this point of the semester, you'd be... See, not, there's not a whole lot of people smiling in here. But as soon as you look at your grades, you're going to be smiling because... There's a whole lot of students that were emailing me, you know, after the exam. Oh, Dr. B, I think I'm going to fail, you know. I, you know, my grade, I, it's just not, you know. And, and I was looking at grades last night. I thought, well, this, this student's got to see. They're not failing. They're not even close. And this student over here has got a B. This student over here has got an A. And I even emailed a few of you last night. I don't, I don't know who I emailed, but uh, a few of you. Question. Are the bonus points included in our total? The bonus points are included in the total as a public service to preserve my mind from being bugged by students asking me about bonus points. However, However, the bonus points from clicking are not in there yet. So the only bonus point is you have are, you know, zero, zero to four for early iClicker registration. But we're going to have some bonus point activity this week in web courses. We're going to have some bonus point activity in class on Thursday. If you're here with your clicker, you know, a little review set. And, uh, and then it, by, by the end of, the, by this weekend, we'll be able to uh, have the clicker situation, you know, where you, where you get four bonus points if you have 75% of the questions answered correctly. Uh, that will, you know, after Thursday, you know, when we do our last um, clicking, our last regular clicking, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have that squared away. All right, now you can see here early eye clicker registration. And then down there a little bit further, uh, homework scores. So I, I have a number there for your homework scores. I think, is, is anybody on right now? Uh, is the homework scores displayed? Yeah, they're on there. Yeah. Okay, it's just exam three, so it'll look something like this. But exam three, I forgot to do that. And a little bit further down, you got best two midterms, and then the exam code. And this this is uh, exam code one twenty three is for a hyp hypothetical student that's taken all three. Okay, so there's the exam code. 
and then a little bit further down. Uh, now, exam three, part two is up because that was in web courses. Exam three clicking, apparently I forgot to upload that in the exam three total, but I will try to do that this afternoon. Um, also, down here, the roundup, this has been up since uh, a couple Fridays ago, I think. Uh, roundup 11.15, that was the last date that we did any official clicking, regular clicking in class. And so as you know, hopefully you remember, the decimal fraction part of the roundup tells you how many you've answered. So this student has answered 51 questions and they've gotten 43 questions correct. All right? Now the 25 points participation comes out of how many you answer. Well, we talked about that already. And the bonus pointage comes out of, and down here, how many you have correct. Now if that's 75% or more as of Thursday, at the end of class on Thursday, then you'll get four bonus points, which is a nice little chunk of change. And for... For those of you that have blooped up, you know, like a couple assignments, you know, getting a few bonus points is going to help out nicely. Same thing with like, you forgot your, or your neighbor, or your roommate uh, ate your home, or your roommate stole your eye clicker or borrowed it and didn't return it for three weeks. Uh, all this stuff can, can really help. All right. Now, at the very bottom of the grades page, are you looking? Look at the color of this. See the little outline? I don't see it. I see some people looking at their phones. See what color that is? Kind of a thick, greenish, almost a puke colored. There's a reason for that. I hate these rows in your grade book because they always misunderestimate your or misoverestimate your grades. Like the this, this student here, I mean, this is an actual student it's called test student. First name test, last name student. And every instructor's got one. And he's got 108% for general data. And then at the end, you know, he's got, uh, for, for his total pointage, he's got 184%. But that's, that's because uh, web courses, Canvas cannot handle our grading system. So I shut the, you know, uh, Justin Cohen, where are you at today? Justin, he's absent. Uh, if you want to know where these numbers are and why they're not in there, it is because you, they, you cannot get these programmed. They're just a, it, Canvas can. And all they do is just add them up. They just, you know, add them up willy-nilly. But we can't do that. So my strategy for all these things, general data, bonus point activity, is just, you know, do not, you know, do not activate. In other words, no. No way. All right? Now, the reason, as I said, because our grading scheme is a little dip, bit different than what, I mean, Canvas thinks that it's like second grade. You just add up the number of points. But, you know, we don't do that. This is, this is UCF. But here's our grade scale. You have a total points line on your grade space. So if you're 135 or more, ding, you've got an A going into the final. You can still biff it. You can still do a face plant. If you don't come to the fun, if you come an hour late to 
the final, I guarantee you, somebody will have finished in about 30 minutes. So if you come at 1030, there's a very good ch- See, like there's, here's a guy coming in late. 1050. It's 20 minutes late. All right? If you come in 30 minutes late on the final, you might, I, I might, and I, I've done it before and I'll do it again. I don't give a, you know, you know what? You're toast. You may not take the final. And I don't care if you go and call your mom and then your mom calls my boss. That is the rule. You got to be here before the first person finishes. You got to be here at 10. If you're here at 10, everything's golden. You just, you know, you have a good three hours, everything's fine. If you're not, if you have 113 points or more right now going into the final, you have a B. 90 points or more, you have a C. And a few of you are pretty darn close to having 90 points. Matter of fact, the third column, I want you to look at. That tells you the number of students out of 400 or so in both sections that have taken two exams or more. A a few people, you know, kind of dropped out. But of students that have taken, John, two, two exams or more, 60 have A's. That's 15%. Do you know if I graded on the curve, I would not be able to do that? 10% is what they say. 10% A's. But you, if you earn an A in this class, you got it. 189, 189 students have a B. And you, you, know, you may not have looked at your total points as of 1120, but when you do, and then you look at the, the middle column here, you'll think to yourself, dude, I got a B. How did that happen? And some of you, I can see you guys laughing over here. It's, it's funny watching you guys react. But, you know, it's, it's lovely to be able to tell you, to have this grading system where... It, and you know what it is? It's, it's faithfully clicking and faithfully doing homework. And they come in like gangbusters. You know, they come, you know what they do? They come in like the cavalry in a John Wayne movie. Right at the end, you know, to save, save your bacon. To save your grade. And baby, it is nice. And so last night I was emailing, a few, or not emailing, but uh, messaging in Canvas a few students, and I was telling my wife, boy, this is a, I, love, I love this part of the semester. Because, you know, this, t- this part of the semester, students are always nervous about their grades. Dr. B, I just, I, you know, I'm, you know they're especially newbie freshmen, you know. They don't know how the grades work and stuff. But then I show them their numbers and stuff. No, you got a B. You got an A. You got a C. And there's only 14 people here with a D and six with an F. You know, I can't, you know, it's, it's not going to work for everybody, but for, you think about that, six people out of 400, approximately, that ain't bad. You know, I'd like that number to be zero. If I could get that to zero, I'd be happy. I want everybody to pass. Same with the 14, I'd like that to be zero. At least a C or better. But we're doing all right. You've got a decent uh, set of grades, all right? And that is my patented grading system, which Canvas cannot handle. So, Dora. How can we calculate that? Is this, do we count the, the test only? You don't have to calculate it. I've already done it. It's in WebCore. The question was, how do we calculate my total points? And the answer is, I've already done it for you. It's posted under, I think it's at the very top, total points as of 1120. And, when, you know, and then, you, then you go and look at this table and figure out where you stand. 
One more thing about grades. Two more things. Uh, we could talk over your grades, your specific numbers and stuff in office hours, but not in messaging. Don't send me an inbox message because it'll just be too many of you. But office hours, oh, by the way, we'll have mega office hours Monday. And not in, you know, and, and not during the SI review. All right, so I'll have mega office hours in the morning. All right. And so if you want to talk about your grades, it's fine. And regular office hours tomorrow, 11 a.m. to, new, to 1 p.m. Uh, or if you could track me down like Chinatown, you know, I usually got my computer with me and my, I'll just pop open the spreadsheet and look at your stuff and say, yeah, okay, you got to be here, whatever it is. I'll be able to tell you. All right. And some of you were thinking, you know, how am I going to... How am I going to survive? Dr. B, I'm so nervous. And it's, you know, and I, you know, I, I don't laugh, but I mean, I, I think to myself, yeah, okay, we'll see it in a few weeks. And usually they're doing all right. It's great. I love it. The other thing that I want to mention to you, uh, this is the last roundup of grades. We got a little bit of clicking to do today and some more on Thursday. We'll have some regular homework over the weekend. Uh, no homework to sorry to disappoint you, no homework tonight. Uh, but we'll have some regular homework Thursday night and a big review homework Thursday night. Uh, so we got a little bit, but this is going into the final anyway, this is about where you're gonna be at the end of the week where you are today. It's not going to change a whole lot. Other than, you know, you'll, you'll have some bonus points coming in after we, do, we get done clicking and, and other stuff. But the main, the main bulk of the points. So this will be the last time I do any kind of a synopsis. Unless you come and, and track me down in office hours or something. Then we can maybe figure out something new. All right. Questions about grades? All right, let's, let, let's uh, do a clicker question together. And I'm gonna warm up your brain. Your so-called mind. Turn on your clicker, frequency DD as always. Good. Question one, and type in your answer and then hit the send key, because I'm making this a short answer. This is kind of a survey question. Which formula for gravitational potential energy near the surface of the Earth? Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Who typed in letter M? <laughs> no, don't type in don't type in the formula, type in a, either A or B. <coughs> and hit the send key. All right, you were warned. 
Yeah, the, the answer is that both of these are actually correct. So make sure you write those down. Because our topic for today is the energy uh, profile of the hydrogen atom. And so what we're really going to be talking about is potential energy. Um, and we're going to compare electrical and gravitational because they're so similar. Now, here's the formula that we used several weeks ago with the free fall tables. You know, we could figure out, you know, the downward speed if we, you know, if we knew the total energy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here, and, and, th and that's a, this is perfectly good if you're in the, the 40 kilometers or so uh, from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean up to the top of Mount Everest. If, you, if, if that's your distance from the center of the Earth, this formula is good. If you're not, if you're out in the space shuttle or halfway to the moon or anywhere else, you know, more than a few, you know, the edge of space is 100 kilometers. So if you're, you know, 100 kilometers or more, this is a little bit more precise. And you may think to yourself, hey, Dr. B, um, how come the distance dependence for the first formula is why uh, the altitude above the surface of the Earth or above the basketball floor or whatever you decide to be the zero point, how come that's the way it is? But in the general formula, how come the distance is down in the denominator? Well, I'll tell you why. Two facts in this. The first equation has a symbol G, little g. Little g encodes the gravitational force gm1 m2 over r squared if you're near the surface of the earth matter of fact it encodes capital g times the mass of the earth times the approximate radius at the surface of the earth if you don't go very far above or below the sea level um, then the first formula is perfectly fine and little g encodes um, the uh, the force if you're outside that zone, uh, then you've got to use this one. If you want to be precise, anyways. If you don't want to be precise. It's... Now, electrostatic potential energy looks similar in general. Here's what it looks like. Now, this is the electrostatic potential energy for a hydrogen atom. And that's what we're going to try to focus on today. We're shooting for the periodic table on Thursday. So we're going to... Talk about hydrogen. Now, this is hydrogen. Here's the charge on a proton, E. And then in the second parenthesis, minus E. That's the charge on the ele electron. Because that's what a hydrogen is. It's, a, it's a, a proton and an electron bound together, and the electron zipping around the proton. The proton is 2,000 times heavier, approximately than the electron. So the electron's moving and the proton's just kind of sitting there. It's not really doing much. And then, of course, here's the compact form of that. Minus Ke squared over R. Okay, so that looks a little bit different. I mean, it's, we've got it, you know, slightly different symbols. We use charges instead of masses, but... It's the, the main thing is 1 over R dependence. So the energy levels depend on the distance that you are from the center of the Earth or the distance that you are from the center of the proton, the center of the nucleus. As a side note, I'll point out something that um, elaborates on a topic that we talked about, excuse me, last or, or two weeks ago, and that is the electric field. We, sh I showed you pictures of the electric field of a, the sphere on top of the Van de Graaff generator. Okay, and the, for a positive, positively charged sphere, 
the field lines go outwards, radially outwards, like the quills of a porcupine or a sea urchin. If the charge is negative, the, field, the electric field lines go inward. If we have a dipole, a plus and a minus, fairly close to each other, then we get those kind of curved but yet symmetric field lines that look kind of like the magnetic field lines that you may have done when you were in grade school, you know, with a, a bar magnet and some iron filings and a piece of paper. Remember doing that? Now, that's the electric field. The electric field is analogous to the electric force. The electric force is measured in Newtons, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. The electric field is K times Q over R squared. So it's, the electric field is measured in Newtons per Coulomb. That's item A. Now, the analog, uh, the the quantity that's analogous to electrical potential energy, EPE, is voltage. And voltage is the, is the energy per unit charge that is spatially oriented, spatially organized around any charge array, whether it's a Van de Graaff generator or a nucleus of a hydrogen atom. And so the units of voltage are joules per coulomb. All right? And uh, an electron charge times a volt. You know, so coulomb times a volt. Okay, coulomb's household size of current. That's a metric unit for household size electrical systems. But you know, the electron charge, E, the fundamental charge, that's good for atomic systems. So an electron charge times a volt, an EV or an electron volt, that's also an energy unit. And my wonderful students, that is the energy unit that we will use for atomic systems because we're trying to figure out hydrogen today and helium. All right? And so we're going to start talking about electron volts instead of joules. You know, kind of how when we were doing calorie, when we were doing heat concepts, we went to grams and, and, and calories instead of kilograms and joules, which we could have done, you know. But usually we do grams and calories. Same thing here. We're going to do atomic energy units, electron volt, the EV. You know, an EV is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. It's a very small fraction of a joule, but it's perfect for atoms. And that's why we're going to use it. Planck's constant, H, you can measure it in joule seconds. And you can also measure it in electron volt seconds. And the second form in electron volt seconds is actually easier to work with. Now, I want to do a demonstration with you up here. Um, and, but I need a couple volunteers from the audience to help me hand stuff out. Come on up. Can you help Rachel, uh, uh, Maria? And let me pause the YouTube. For All right. So uh, now, uh, for those of you in the sound of my voice that are not actually present here, uh, you can look at demonstrations of this. Uh, the spectrum of hydrogen, at least, uh, on YouTube. And this picture is from one of those um, YouTubes. There's several about diffraction of, of light. Okay, now, I, something I want to point out to you. If we were in a lab, and instead of being up on a stage, oh, uh, before we get to that, Send your diffraction gratings to the aisle, please. Send your diffraction gratings to the aisle. And try not to put your fingerprints on them.
Okay, can, can you go up the aisle? No, not those guys, you. Yeah. Can you go up the, can you go up the aisle and collect? And uh, could you, young lady, could you go up the aisle and collect? Both sides. And then bring them back down here to the front. Thank you for doing that. Let me turn the lights up. a little bit better. Yeah, just put them up on the table there by the. Anybody else have their? All right, thank you. All right, now, as I was as I was saying, if if we were in the laboratory. And we had everything out on like one big table and everything at the same level. We could make measurements, do a little bit of trig, and we could figure out the wavelength based on the angle. You know, because like the diffraction colors, the discrete colors are off to the left and off to the right by a specific number of degrees, you know, like 22.5 degrees. If you do some trig and some Pythagorean theorem, you can figure out from that what the wavelength is. Okay? The separation from the central image and so forth. Now, here's what the wavelengths look like. The red one, that big red, beautiful red from hydrogen, that's called H alpha. It's the primary in the visible series of colors. For hydrogen, the discrete spectrum of hydrogen. Now the kind of aqua, almost almost tealish color, is called H beta. And if you work that one out, the the, the the wavelength is 486 nanometers. You know, for H alpha, it's 656. And then you know, you know, for H alpha, once you get the wavelength in the laboratory, you know, do a little trig and stuff. Then you use C equals lambda F and figure out F. And we did this before, 457 terahertz for H alpha. That is why I used that wavelength a couple weeks ago. With H beta, 617 terahertz. The purpley, did anybody see the purpley, the two purpley blue lines? Anybody see one? Purpley blue. Nobody saw it. You, nobody here saw the purple? Raise your hand if you saw it. Okay. A few people. All right. There's some purpley. So the rest of you got caught napping. But there's some purple. There's actually two of them. One of them called H gamma. And, you know, do the trig and the Pythagorean theorem and everything. 434 nanometers. C equals lambda F. 691 terahertz for the frequency. The frequency is pretty important. And then there's a fourth kind of purpley, you know, way down in the purples, H delta. And that one works out to 410 nanometers. Frequency 732. So the, the bigger the wavelength, the smaller the frequency. And they all, you know, both columns multiply out to 
The speed of light, of course, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now here's the question that we want to think about. Why doesn't hydrogen, which we have in the table here, um, and you know, it's not that hard. Everybody here in this classroom, if we had a lab for this class, you'd be able to measure these wavelengths. It's not hard. Uh, but why isn't hydrogen like the thermal light source, the red hot, the hot light bulb? You know, the hot light bulb was a continuous spectrum. Why don't, why don't we get a continuous rainbow? Why only these colors and no others? You know, there's certain, certain colors that are not allowed. You know, for hydrogen anyways, you have a red, you have a blue, you have a couple purpley blue ones. And you know what else you got, you guys, from, from hydrogen? You got some ultraviolet. Now, we can't see that. But if we had ultraviolet uh, detectors, you know, we could measure that. Infrared, we can't see that with our eyes. But, you know, if we had infrared detection, you know what they use for infrared? Uh, instead of using glass, they use uh, silicon. Silicon is transparent. You know, the same silicon that they use for electronics. It's uh, transparent to infrared. So here's the, the bottom line question in boldface and underline. Is there any kind of a pattern in wavelength or frequency? I mean, because it's not, there, there seems to be some rule here that only certain colors for hydrogen, same thing for helium. Very specific set of colors. Those are the, the, what I call the quantum fingerprints of hydrogen and helium. When an astronomer sees those colors, you know, looking at a star, they send the starlight through a prism or a diffraction grating like what you guys just used. And they see those colors, they know, ah, I've got a lot of hydrogen. Or I've got a lot of hydrogen and I've got a little bit of helium because I can see helium colors too. And, of course, a lot of stars, you'll see neon. And all the, you'll see sodium, oxygen, nitrogen. You, see, you sometimes see uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in the surface of a star. But why is there a pattern? Well, the, there is a pattern. It's not, it, it doesn't depend on the frequency, you know, like doubling the frequency or anything like that. Apparently... The inverse wavelength, 1 over lambda, depends on a bunch of squares. 1 over 2 squared and 1 over n squared. And the h alpha, the value of n is 3. h beta, the value of n is 4. h gamma, n equals 5. h delta, n equals 6. And on up. And the guy that figured this out, his name is Joseph Balmer, B-A-L-M-E-R, a uh, guy from Switzerland. Now, he didn't know why this pattern, here's the, here's the same formula. He figured it out, you know, it must have taken a ton of scratch paper and a lot of long nights worrying it over and thinking, you know, what is the pattern in these wavelengths? What is the pattern in these frequencies? And he finally figured it out. You take the number 2 and you square it, and you put it in the denominator. And then you take the number n for, for uh, red, n equals 3. You square it, and then you, and you put it in the denominator, and then you subtract that from 1 over 2 squared. And then you multiply by this number r called the Rydberg constant. It works out to be 1.097 times 10 to the 7 inverse meters, meters to the minus one. That's the Rydberg constant, uh, for hydrogen anyway. So there's a different constant for other elements. Um, and, and, then, and that gives you one over lambda. Now how he decided to think about inverse wavelength, I have no idea. But he, he you know, I would have just been looking at lambda, f, f times lambda, F divided by lambda, lambda divided by F. But he looked at 1 over lambda, and he found the pattern. This is the Balmer formula. 
Now let's work it out for n equals 6. Here we go. And just jot this down. And what we're going to do is put in, you know, the 2 squared is permanent. That's part of the Balmer series. Okay? But then the, the number n is going to be changed. It could be a 3, 4, 5, or a 6. So let's do 6. So n equals 6, that means n squared is 36. So your first line here in this second equation block, inside the parentheses, 1 fourth, that's 1 over 2 squared, minus 1 36th, that's 1 over 6 squared. All right. And then the, the Rydberg constant, and the Rydberg constant, I think it's named after some guy from uh, Sweden or something like that. And then one over, so we're not doing anything with the Rydberg constant yet. And one over land is just kind of parked over there. Now, the, the middle equation here <coughs> is now in, inside the parentheses, inside the square brackets, I'm switching to 36 common denominators. So one fourth is the same as nine over 36. And then I already have one over 36 in the other one. So nine minus one is eight. So the third line down inside the square brackets now, all I, I just compute that, and simplify it. And I get eight over 36. All right, so then you can go to your calculator now, you know, and go uh, 1.097 EE7, and then times eight divided by 36, and you get 2.438 EE6. Now that's inverse meters, meters to the minus one. That's the Rydberg constant. This is a formula for the inverse wavelength. So to get the wavelength, just take this answer and flip-flop it. All right, so let's do that now. So let's flip-flop that answer. We'll get lambda instead of 1 over lambda. All right, so 1 over lambda, 2.438 times 10 to the 6 meters to the minus 1. Okay, so 1 over that is 1 over 2.438 times 10 to the 6 meters to the minus 1. Now, meters to the minus 1 in the denominator is the same as meters to the regular one in the numerator. So my answer is going to be in meters, which is good. I'm supposed to have a wavelength, you know, a wavelength is going to be meters or nanometers or something. Right, so we're, we're looking good for units. And we just got to do, you know, so what you do on, what you do on your calculator, if you have one, and actually, I don't know what the, let me look at my calculator here. Uh, on a mat, on an iPhone, on an iPhone you have a one over x button, and some calculators it'll say x to the minus one. That's your one over button. Okay, so two point four three eight times ten to the six, and then the one over x button, and you get zero point zero, a bunch of zeros, and then a four one zero oh two. All right. Now, if we were doing a written exam like engineering students and physics majors take, this would be fine. I couldn't mark it wrong. But if you want to an answer in nanometers, which we're going to do, uh, you got to convert meters, a tiny fraction of a meter, into a few nanometers. All right. So you just move the decimal point nine spots to the right and uh, you get 410.2 nanometers and that's down at the limit you know because uh, violet to red is 400 to 700 nanometers so this one's down pretty close Afrin to the uh, the bottom of the Violet. And on your homework Thursday night, your regular homework, last regular homework of the semester, I'll give you a, maybe one or two questions about how to calculate this and stuff. Fairly simple. Right? And 
You're going to want to be ready to do a calculation of this kind uh, on the final as well. So, so let me pause for questions. Yes. Ten of the six comes from. It comes from the Rydberg constant. See that? It's 1.097 times 10 to the 7. And then the, this number in parentheses, in brackets, that's less than 1. So that's going to convert it into something times 10 to the 6 instead of something times 10 to the 7. All right, so, so that's where it comes from. Winfield. So um, why would we have to use meters to the negative 1? Because that's the value of the Rydberg constant in the metric system for hydrogen. That's just the way that they chose to, I mean, they could have done one over that, and then it would have been a, a small number of meters. But they chose to make it a big number of inverse meters. So, but it's a constant of nature. It's a constant for hydrogen, I should say. And uh, it's something that we measure in the lab. And, uh, you know, so that's how that works. Okay. All right. Yeah. Another question. Okay. Let's keep going. All right, we already did this. Now, here's the bottom line for us. And here's the arrangement. And this is a professionally done photograph of the uh, diffraction lines for hydrogen. There's a beautiful H alpha, very bright, all the way on the right. And then H beta, that kind of aqua line, then H gamma and H delta, and there's actually another one, H epsilon, down in there, if you could see it. And I have one of the wavelengths, 656 nanometers for H alpha. And students, astronomers are always thinking about H alpha, simply because hydrogen is so common in the universe. Every star is just a big ball of hydrogen. The sun is a big ball of hydrogen. And a little bit of helium thrown in there. And all the other elements of the periodic table are real teeny fractions. Although here on Earth, you know, Earth compared to the sun, Earth is a teeny little blip of rock. For us, we've got plenty of iron, plenty of chromium, Plenty of oxygen. Do you know the two most common elements in the crust of the earth? Silicon and oxygen. And iron's in there. There's a lot of iron. There's a lot of sodium. But all those are relatively small fractions of 1%. Except here on earth. You know, you get an accumulation of them. And I can't overemphasize this one. This regularity, this pattern, it is not a coincidence there is a physical reason for this counting and calculating rule, the Balmer formula. It's not a coincidence. There's a physical reason for it. And we're going to be talking about the physical reason for it today. Now, here's, an, here's our star, the sun. This is the rainbow. But here's another thing. If you have some hydrogen, it'll produce a lot of H alpha, but it can also absorb H alpha. If it's not producing, it can absorb H alpha. And this little gap down here, down here in the red, right above the word spectrum, yeah, that's probably H alpha being absorbed from out of the spectrum of the sun. You know, the sun is a burning hot ball of gas. 
produces a continuous spectrum. But the atmosphere of the sun has got a lot of out, it's got a lot of hydrogen in it, and all these other little gaps in the colors, you can't see them, but we can measure them. I mean, you, you see them, but you don't really know that you're missing, you know, you don't really know that you're missing this color green right here. You know, that might be for chromium or magnesium or something like that. And then up here, 410 H delta is way up in here somewhere, up in the purples. And you don't know that you're missing it, but it is, it's missing. You know, we, we string out the spectrum, just space it out so that it's, you know, really wide, we'll start seeing gaps. Here's a fame. let me turn off the lights for this one. This is a famous nebula. This is called the Rosette Nebula. And this is mainly H alpha. It's beautiful red. But here's a picture of the same nebula where they've, t they've measured other than H alpha. They measured sulfur. Yeah, sulfur has a fingerprint of its own. Oxygen has a fingerprint of its own. So what they did here is, all right, let's make a false color picture and we'll, call, we'll color all of sulfur's um, bright color. We'll color that red. All the oxygen, the, the discrete spectrum of oxygen, that'll be green. It's kind of hard to see the green here, except maybe over here on the, the left side. And then we'll make false color blue of all the H alpha photons coming in. So we can use these all over the place uh, to figure out the quantum theory of hydrogen. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the next couple of minutes. Here it is. We think of hydrogen as an electron orbiting a proton. It's lovely. We know the electrical potential energy for that. The quantum theory says because the electron produces the light, only certain orbital levels are permitted. These are what, are, what we call quantum leaps. You can't go to any intermediate orbit, but only the, one of these four. There's a lowest level, the n equals one level, and my wonderful students, that is known as the ground state for the electron. The electron can, you know, so you got these countable energy levels, and they correspond to different altitudes, and only very specific altitudes, and what H alpha is, it's H alpha is a photon of light that is emitted when an electron jumps from n equals 3 down to n equals 2. And when that happens, like right here, when it jumps downward, there's your quantum leap downward, it it emits the, the energy, the electrical potential energy that it loses goes into the photon. And that controls the energy of the photon. So the structure of the... So, when we, so here's what I want you to remember. When we look at the colors from hydrogen, it is telling us the different altitudes of the orbits of electrons that are permitted. There's four specific orbits for the Balmer series. H alpha, H beta, H gamma, H delta. This, those correspond to four orbits above n equals two. There's n equals three, n equals four, n equals 5 and n equals 6 for H, uh, for H delta, 410 nanometers. Now, no homework tonight. Come Thursday, and we'll talk some more about these two cats 
Einstein and Niels Bohr, you're dismissed.